So, hi everyone, my name is Frédéric Passeron and uh, welcome to this HP Dev Talk, which will be the 31st, uh, 31 Dev Talk. So, the subject that will be covered hopefully today by Sam, if he shows up, is Smart Sim and bringing simulation and AI together at scale. So, the speaker will be Sam Party from uh, Cray uh, R&D. And he showed up a moment ago, but disappeared. So we'll give it uh, some time while I'll be presenting to actually come back, hopefully. So for those who don't know yet what the Dev Talks are about, uh, maybe it should be interesting for you to reach out to some of the <clears throat> some of the links that we'll be providing to. So before the, the before the talk starts, I mean I'll go through a very few housekeeping items. Being uh, the calendar, for instance. So if you reach out to the URL that one of my colleagues is gently pasting in the chat, you will see that there are uh, many Dev Talks that have been uh, already. Uh, delivered over the past. I mean, we've been there for a year now. And uh, so for each of them, you get the register link or you get the replay as well if you were not able to attend to them. The next session will be held on the 21st of July. And it will be talking about recovering important cloud native application in the task based DevOps world by Prashanto Kushavara. And uh, also, we're planning a few stuff for August, even though. Some of us will be on vacation. Some of us will also be working. So stay tuned on this. I know that DJ is preparing something around Kubernetes and some other cool stuff, I would say. Uh, as part of the HP Dev program, we also need your help. Okay. So, I mean, we are, I mean, I'm leading the workshops on demand, uh, I would say, program. And uh, so it's available on the on the following uh, workshop uh, URL here. And you will see there are around 20 of them and we keep adding them on a monthly basis. So it's free uh, it's free and experience is uh, free of charge. It's available 24 by seven, as long as the data center is up and running, I would say. Uh, there are some surveys that you can fill up at the end of each of uh, the workshop that we lately introduced some badge program and uh, we'll be very happy to, to get you some badges for any workshop that you will be finishing, I would say. And if you finish more than one and you go to five or seven or 10 or 15, you'll get some wonderful badges they can share over uh, some you know, social media like Twitter or LinkedIn, for instance. You can also contribute and win a wonderful background as Tina is thinking about. So you can do some blogs, okay? Uh, write some technical blogs about the technology or a subject that you are mastering, okay? You can work with us on some dev talks and obviously uh, be able to spread out some of the cool things that you have learned about the technology or uh, um, experience that you have shared with a customer, for instance. Speaking of which, you can actually invite your customers to our uh, Munch and Learn. So Munch and Learn are similar things to the DevTalks, where, where DevTalks are internal. The Munch and Learn are widely open, meaning that you can invite your customer to attend them. The next one will be taking place on July 28th, and it will be around how to make data consumable for real-world data science. And there is another one for August on Kubernetes 101, and it will be hands on base as well. So uh, you can check out the Mention Learn uh, agenda on the URL. And also, very importantly, uh, there is a survey that we would like you to take uh, into account, which is a slash data developer survey. And you can invite your customer actually to go for it as well. It takes a bit of time, but it's really important for uh, HP to actually take a, a, an image of uh, what people think uh, when it comes to when it comes down to HP and developer. Uh, it's not necessarily the first, uh, I would say, couple that you would think about, but we're trying to change this. So it's really important that we get some data around this. And finally, uh, please communicate. I mean, the, the deaf program and the deaf team is only probably less than 10 people. And uh, we we'll try to shout out. And uh, as you can see, my voice is getting tired of shouting probably. And so we really need you to help us out in this way. So you can use the, chat, the, the Yammer uh, groups, or you can use the Slack channels, or you can use Twitter. And there is one single slide that we know about and that we would like you to use. And I'll be showing it at the very end, but this is the one that we want you to use. Okay. Awesome. Great. So my name is Matt Ellis. Um, I'm one of the members of the SmartSim team. Um, and I'm just going to give a quick overview of what SmartSim is, what it does, um, 
and what we hope to do in the future a little bit. So um, with that, I'll just jump right in. So um, SmartSim is an open source library dedicated to accelerating the convergence of AI, analytics, and data science with numerical simulations models. Um, this is particularly interesting and challenging because historically numerical simulation models um, that are run on HPC platforms are, are traditionally written in C, Fortran, and C++, while the data science e ecosystem is really um, py Pythonic, right? It's written in um, dynamically typed languages. Um, and to date, those haven't really been um, you know, super compatible or, or, or really merged together. And SmartSim is, is really meant to bring those two ecosystems together. Um, so very specifically, SmartSim enables scientists to embed machine learning components into Fortran C and C++ simulations. So with very little um, changes to your, your HPC code, you can now uh, embed and run machine learning models directly from the simulation. Um, also in real time online, you can run and monitor those uh, simulations from a Jupyter notebook. Also, you can run your entire workflow from a single Python script, which um, I think unless you've actually tried to run these very complex simulations with machine learning on the side, um, you might not kind of get how impressive or hard that is, um, but that's something that we've seen as we talk to users that they really love, um, that now their entire workflow is in a single Python script that is actually very port portable between the machines as well. Um, we can create and, and configure ensembles of simulations for the users. Um, and I guess just if you're not familiar what an ensemble is for a scientific application, um, a lot of times you'll do parametric studies um, and you'll, you'll want to just run maybe, uh, I don't know, hundreds of a sim simulation with one per parameter change. And SmartSim just makes that very easy to do. And, and moreover, because of the um, architectural cho choices that we've made, um, we are, it's very easy to plug in tools like Dask, X-Ray, PySpark um, into this SmartSim framework to, to do either data extraction or analysis. And I think most importantly from a, a performance standpoint um, is that all of this bypasses the file system. So there's a lot of approaches that um, might do pieces of what I just mentioned, um, but they usually touch the file system. Um, and of course that makes it very hard to scale um, to very large simulations. So one of the key fe features of SmartSim is that um, it's really truly an in-transit in-memory um, framework. So that's just a very high level. I'm just gonna keep diving deeper. Feel free to interrupt with questions, um, but that's just kind of a, a, a quick uh, overview of what um, I'll talk about. So let's dive a little bit more into what uh, actually makes up SmartSim in, in terms of the code base. So SmartSim is, is um, kind of split into two libraries. Um, the one set or, or the one library um, is the Smart Redis clients. And these Redis clients are what gets actually embedded into your application. So the core client is written in C++. And then we have wrappers on that core client in Fortran, C, and Python. So across all of these languages, we have very um, coherent APIs, um, and that is what actually gets embedded by the user into their, their application. The second library, which is the infrastructure library, um, and sometimes we'll just call it SmartSim, but it's, it's really the infrastructure library, um, is what allows users to, to launch and manage these very uh, complex machine learning uh, scientific application workflows. Um, and what these, what, what the infrastructure library does is it basically abstracts a lot of the um, nitty gritty details you would need to know about your particular system or workload manager and allows you to launch what is the infrastructure that is required to run machine learning alongside these scientific applications. And that infrastructure library really just presents a very simple and clean um, Python interface to the user. So they don't have to uh, write a lot of bash scripts or anything like that, which 
quite frankly, I used to do before we had SmartSim. So um, it just makes things very clean and easy for the users. So here's um, the architectural overview of SmartSim and, and how it works. Um, again, there, there's two libraries and you'll see those designated in uh, blue and green here. We have the infrastructure library and the smart Redis library. Um, the infrastructure library uh, users access through either a Jupyter notebook or a standard Python script. And on the left here, uh, you see highlighted in, in yellow. Um, and, and they use that just through a very simple from SmartSim import experiment. It's, it's super lightweight. And through that, that API, they build what we call an experiment. And those experiments um, contain entities such as a scientific application, or an orchestrator, as you see here on the right, which is our name for what allows them to store data, run scripts, or run AI models. And I'll get a little bit more into the, the details of what the orchestrator is and does in a little bit. Um, but those are the, the two main entities that we think about when we, we launch things from SmartSim. And as I said, SmartSim on the top left here kind of sits between the user and their typical workload manager like Slurm, PEBS, Cobalt, or even on a laptop, you can launch all of this. So um, the user doesn't need to know how to do specific resource management work to launch the orchestrator or an entity um, onto the machine. Um, to put this in more like concrete details of, of what we're actually doing with uh, the SmartSim in infrastructure library. And also to talk a little bit about that orchestrator that I just kind of glossed over. So again, SmartSim, there's a Python in interface. It sits between the user and their workload manager. And, and what it does is, and this for this example, just think of a typical um, molecular dynamics scientific application. Um, and this is, really just a pure MPI application. So, you know, before SmartSim, before, you know, the ability to run machine learning alongside the simulation, it would have just been, you know, an M MPI uh, simulation across multiple compute nodes. And SmartSim still does that for the user. So if SmartSim, you know, you, you did not want to run machine learning alongside this application, that's fine. We can still really make, make it much e easier for you to launch this on any high performance computing platform um, and still kind of do the same M MPI and resource allocations that you would do before. But the, the beauty of, of SmartSim is that it also allows the user to very easily, and by easily, I mean like two commands, launch a, launch a uh, SmartSim orchestrator alongside that traditional M M MPI application. So the orchestrator um, is what we call kind of the, the um, centralized loop location for both the data and where we can run both uh, Python scripts and machine learning models. So that or orchestrator can live on separate compute nodes so that it has all of the resources on the compute nodes um, or on certain workload managers, it can actually be co-located with the sim sim simulation. Um, in this diagram that I have here, it's just shown as a separate compute node for sim sim simplicity, um, but know that it can share the, the resources on a compute node with a, an application. Um, so the SmartSim or, or, or orchestrator, again, is a um, in-memory database. So just think of a key value store. So you, when you put things into the database, it's basically just accessed with a key, like a Python dictionary. So if you say, um, you know, get my key, it'll return the value. You just need one key value to, to access the data in the um, in memory database. Um, that is a Redis database, um, and Redis is a great open source in memory database. Um, it has a really rich ecosystem of, of, of tools. And one of the great things about the Redis database is there's a Redis module that allows us to give act or give users access to TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Onyx. And when we give users access to these machine learning backends with a single API call from their scientific application, they can run these machine learning backends on the, the hardware, the compute hardware in the orchestrator um, with a single call. And I'll get into what the API looks like in a little bit. 
Um, but it's a really quick and seamless way for the user without much adaptations to their original source code to have access to these machine learning backends. Um, and these backends run both on a CPU or a GPU. So um, lots of flexibility there for the user. Um, and then I guess I should point out that the, the application, in this case, the, the molecular dynamics simulation communicates with that orchestrator over TCP. Um, so again, just those very simple client functions that we've written allow the, the application to communicate back and forth with, with the orchestrator. Um, and I just went over that, so I'll just skip forward. Um, I mentioned the, the API of Smart Redis. So um, one of the things that we've tried really hard to do is just um, across all four languages, Fortran, C, Python, and C++, first to have a very coherent API such that it allows scientists to um, kind of develop and, and share their work in one language and port that to another one. So that was really important to us. But another thing that we learned from kind of seeing um, other kind of data storage tools that we worked with, with before that couldn't even do the machine learning side, but just the data storage side is the APIs were just so heavy. The, the, the users had to actually put in quite a bit of code into their application um, just to do the very simplest of tasks, right? So th the other thing that we really tried to do is just keep the API very simple. So you'll see here on this slide, um, these are all the calls that the user would, would potentially need to put a tensor in the database. So any n-dimensional tensor from a compiled or Python application, run a machine learning model on the back end. So to put the model into the database and to run the model or to run any PyTorch script. So put a PyTorch script in the data database and run that script. So here we have a total of nine API calls that allow any application in those languages to put tensors in the database and then do data processing and machine learning model in, in, inference on that database. So when we say it's lightweight, it is truly lightweight. We've put this in applications in the matter of like, I don't know, hours. And the big hur hurdle is learning about their application, not ours. We have like nine lines of code. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just really easy for users to get set up. And then on top of those basic functions, which um, I should mention, these are all the, the data structures, the tensor, the, tensor, the model, the script um, that Redis uh, kind of requires to use those machine learning backends. On top, top of that, we offer to the users what we call a data set. Um, the data set just allows users to group together tensors and metadata um, to preserve contextual relationships between them. So um, very common in a scientific application, uh, you would just group all of this in information together in some kind of um, output file that's written to disk. The da data set kind of allows users to do that out output file type data storage, um, but to do it in, in memory database. And the great thing about this is that you can access that group of answers or metadata with a single key, right? So you don't have to remember a lot of keys. You just say, you know, client.get data set and then a single key value and you get all of your information back. Um, again, this a API is very lightweight. Um, there's only nine functions here that you need to uh, use to construct, store, or inspect a data set. Um, and another great backend feature of the data set, which the user only sees through performance gains, is that the data set allows us to do a lot of um, manipulation on the backend to preserve the data lo locality. Um, and that gives us a lot of efficiency gains for model in inference um, and PyTorch, PyTorch script runs. Um, so I think I, I might stop there for right now and just ask if there's any questions on the overview of um, SmartSim and the API and how it works. There's got to be some kind of question. I went so, so quickly and glossed over things. There must be something. <laughs> so far? 
but uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you if you want to and uh, and speak up. I mean, the more interactive, the better the session is. I would say. Okay, if there's no questions, I might just um, kind of dive into um, one of the use cases that we've already done to show kind of the um, full features and power of SmartSim, um, if the audience is interested. And um, is Alessandro Ragazzi on the call? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Al, I might punt to you as we get into this, um, since you did a lot of the machine learning. Sure, learning part. Great. Okay. Um, so one, one, one of our first um, kind of big test cases for SmartSim was a, a collaboration with um, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, they, they do a lot of climate mo modeling um, and oceanographic work. Um, and they have this tool called MOM6. And MOM6 is an old, and I say old only because uh, it, it's, it has a, a rich legacy of, of development that spans you know, many years. Um, it's still currently being de developed, um, but it's been around for, for a long time. Um, and it's written in F Fortran. And they wanted to do some uh, machine learning work to, to replace a parameterization inside of MOM6 to both hopefully improve runtime, but also more importantly, in, improve accuracy. So they, they really wanted to replace what is, uh, when you see the results, you, you'll see that it's actually a pretty coarse um, and uh, bad parameterization within MOM6. So th this was a great use case for SmartSim because um, as MOM6 is written in Fortran, um, their hands were kind of tied and into how do we get modern data science tools into that application. And the people who had the, um, the knowledge base to, to accomplish the, the science work in terms of the, the, the ocean modeling honestly weren't machine learning experts. So they didn't have the background or the, the resources to learn how to spin up all the infrastructure that they needed to uh, to run this kind of pretty complex um, ensemble on a, a supercomputer. So this was like the perfect te test case for SmartSim um, to see if it worked. Um, and it it was a great success for us. Um, and they've been great um, evangelists for us since then because it, it, it was such a big help for them. So the, the goal of this project, as I said, was to augment uh, MOM6 with what is the mean eddy connect energy parameterization um, using a machine learning mo model. Um, the augmented simulation is, is the modular ocean model, we'll just call it MOM6. Um, the training data was just a super high resolution um, run of MOM6, what we call, what, or I'm sorry, um, yeah, it was MOM6, you, you, you know, one tenth degree simulation. So we call that the ground truth, that is like a um, absurdly high resolution ocean model that you could never run in production. It's just too expensive. Um, and then the, the, the simulation that, that uh, our, our machine learning model got put into was an ocean model with also a sea ice model. Um, the mo model that we used with the, was a modified version of ResNet, what we call Eki ResNet, um, Eddy Kinetic Energy ResNet. Um, and the, the inference was done on, so this work was originally done on an internal machine um, where it had 16 compute nodes, each with um, an NVIDIA GPU. And um, MOM6 used up uh, over 3,000 ranks um, on traditional CPU compute nodes. Um, this brings up a, a good point that I, I didn't highlight um, when I talked about the capabilities of Smart Redis um, and what it does with machine learning models for you. So I should just mention that um, uh, a lot of times these smart sim orchestrators, actually most of the time, they span multiple compute nodes. So you can use anywhere from one to thousands of compute nodes to host uh, the data and the machine learning model. And one of the great things about our client, which you won't find in any other open source Redis clients, um, is that it smartly uh, distributes a copy of the machine learning model or PyTorch script to every compute node so that you can very efficiently do ma massively pa parallel evaluations um, of that machine learning model. 
And so uh, in this case for the mom six work, um, they used the smart that's clients to do that. So we were doing um, massively parallel inference across all of those compute nodes. Um, Al, with that, I think I'm gonna hand it off to you because I, I think you could probably explain um, this work the most. Just let me know when you'd like to advance the slide. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so you can start the video, I think. And here you see the predicted EQ values and these are the values we predicted in real time, basically, while the simulation was running uh, with uh, our neural network, so EQ ResNet. So basically, the, the great thing about this was that the results we were computing with the neural network were then fed back into the simulation, and they were used for the next time step. And one of our concerns was obviously that we didn't know if you know, simulation could have exploded or could have gone to zero. Instead, we were very happy in seeing that all the patterns we would expect, like those at the equator and those in the south, the western boundary counter, um, currents and so on, those are all reproduced by our neural network. And this was basically our uh, first assessment of yeah the, the goodness of our approach. We can move to, I guess, next slide. And here you see, uh, we compare our results to the previous state of the art. So the previous state of the art was trying to use simple, simply mathematics and physics models to compute this uh, eigenkinetic energy value. And you see it in the um, low picture. So, and what you see is basically that at the equator, it misses all the features. And the truth data, so basically our ground truth is the data we obtain on the one tenth of degree model uh, has a completely different structure that our model, our uh, smart sim enhanced uh, simulation is more capable of reproducing. If you look at the right hand side in the top, um, the top image, you will see that at the equator we have, we, we can see the activity and the same in the, in the south of the, uh, yeah, of the southern hemisphere, we, we see the activities and the levels are much more comparable to the ground truth than those we observed in the previous state of the art. We can go to next slide. And yeah, we actually also ran a different workload. So once we managed to run and simulate the 10 years, I think, oh, well, one year at the beginning, but so the whole simulation without problems and we saw the results, we decided to go for uh, something like a uncertainty quantification. So basically we ran an ensemble of simulations. So instead of one single simulations, we ran 19, uh, well, 12 at the same time, each one running on 19 nodes of a Cray XC. And we ran it for 10 years of simulation time. Um, what this means is that basically 12 copies of the simulation all started with just slightly different initial conditions ran at the same time, all communicating with the same Redis cluster, running inference with the same neural networks. So different copies of the same neural network. And the, the good thing about this was not only that we could observe some uncertainty and so some statistical value in our, in our simulation and our ensemble, but also that the slowdown was negligible. So it was like below 6% compared to the state of the art. And so basically it's a price you're gonna, you're willing to pay for these kind of results. And we wrote a paper about, uh, which also includes this, and I posted the link to the paper in the chat, and you also find it on the HP dev portal at the end of the article, you will see all the links. And I think we can go to next slide, unless Matt, you want to add something? No, yeah, that was great, Al. That okay. Really great. And okay. yeah. Actually, Al, I uh, lied. I, I, I was going to say one thing. Um, so I think one of the things I also forgot to, to mention about um, SmartSim and Smart Redis is that 
when you do really complex uh, ensembles, uh, ensembles like this, um, SmartSim actually takes care of preventing key co collisions for you. So there's no adaptation that you need to do to each of these ensemble member source codes um, to get this to run. SmartSim actually very uh, kind of seamlessly under the hood take, takes care of all of the, the key manipulations to make sure that none of these collide. And so all of these are running exactly the same um, source code except for input file changes. Um, sorry, Al, I just forgot to say that. <laughs> no, no, that, that's important. Yeah, it's really 12 copies of the same uh, executable. And that's that's also something which is very, very easy to implement them the, 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 in the pipeline. Yeah, current research topic, just uh, we are integrating Ray into SmartSim. So Ray is a work distribution library and it supports a wide ecosystem of applications. Uh, the most important ones are RLlib, which is like the state-of-the-art reinforcement learning uh, toolkit for distributed reinforcement learning. It Basically, it's compatible with the state-of-the-art and an open AI's environment for reinforcement learning. And Ray SGD, which is distributed deep learning training, plus it has HPO and all those uh, uh, great libraries which run then on, uh, well, distributed on any system. And we have implemented and integrated this into SmartSim and it will be available in one of the next releases. Uh, we can go to the next Great, slide. I think I might, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll, you can, yeah. I'll oh, no, let no, you please. finish the, the presentation. Oh. I mean, yeah, sorry, Al, I just thought that was the last slide. <laughs> Go ahead, um, yeah. You, so you know the talk a little bit better than I do. Um, so here, here are some links, um, and we can post these in the chat as, as well. Um, but this is where you can just find some more about SmartSim um, and where you can watch for uh, updates on SmartSim. Um, we, we are hosted currently on PyPy, which means um, two great things. Uh, one, you can just pip install uh, SmartSim, which is just a super e easy way to get started. Um, but another great thing about that is um, you can just kind of stay up to date with our re releases without having to track us on, on GitHub. Um, but please uh, send us any slacks or e emails if you have any questions. Um, and we'd love to take your, your questions right now as well. No question. And one other thing to note, I know um, someone put it in the chat. Um, we do have, uh, you know, I did talk to Sam about the, I'm not sure if he's having technical difficulties or, or what's the issue at the moment, um, but I do know that he has Jupyter Notebooks put, had put together for today. So um, we will make uh, that uh, available uh, for folks um, that can uh, be more of a hands-on uh, tutorial. Yeah, I'll be planning to actually add them to our workshop on demand. So yeah, yeah, that'd be great. plan so that they are available to uh, all year long to anyone. So and as uh, Denis mentioned, we also created a platform page actually on our website for the smart sim uh, resources. So you'll be able to find them on our hpdeveloper.com uh, website as well. It's brand new because I know that uh, Denis and Sam did work on this uh, yesterday and probably that Denis uh, made it available just today. I see. It's actually Ben who oh, ben, provided the, the platform content and I published it uh, yeah, just a few hours ago. Okay. <clears throat> the next step would be a nice Matt or Ben to, to think about a, a blog post that we could uh, tie to the platform that will uh, show uh, data scientists, developers how to leverage smart sim. Uh, yes. This will be a really great uh, blog post. And so there is a question about uh, how do we evaluate, estimate the additional computation, computational cost of smart sim in our model? Can you read it uh, from Adam? Yeah. So. Um... That is uh, a very case-by-case -case thing to look for. I, I think uh, they might be referring to what Al said in, in the MOM6 uh, use case where uh, we had about 5 to 6% overhead for using SmartSim. Um, and that is just pure uh, wall clock time that we measured. Um, 
which includes all data network traffic, but also um, all of the calls to actually run the um, PyTorch model. So that includes the runtime of the machine learning model. So um, that's not just kind of smart sim uh, data transport. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I figured it was case by case. I didn't quite know how to ask the question. Yeah, it, it, it's really hard to generalize just because every, I mean, we, we've seen it in, in follow on use cases, kind of everybody has a different use for smart sim. And it's so it's really hard to give guidance, like a lot of use cases are super data he heavy. And a lot of use cases are like, hey, I only have one tensor, but I want to run this giant model. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to generalize that um, for a talk like this. Um, that, that, that being said, I, I would, I'd be uh, confident to go out on a limb enough to say that the excess runtime really, you don't see it in like the data transport through SmartSim. You tend to just see it in like the pure time that it takes to run a machine learning model. Um, that's kind of like what you tend to run, run up against here. So um, the clients themselves that move all the, the data and the, the models and execute the commands are actually pretty quick um, and lightweight. Okay, that, that, that's good to know that it's sort of the basic infrastructure is rather lightweight is what yeah. you're saying. Mm -hmm. Whatever bells and whistles you want on top of that to do that really determines the additional cost. Yeah, good, good question though. Yeah. Question. We also have a, a repo which is called smartsim-scaling where we host some uh, tests for scaling smartsim on different uh, node configurations, both for simulation and uh, database size. And that could be, that could also give, let's say some hints about the performances. So one could start working on that instead of like using already the of the simulation, the targeted simulation. So um, this is Dale Rensing. I'm part of the HP Dev team. And I have a question actually for the participants, if that's all right. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so I'm interested in knowing why the folks who registered for this, registered for this particular talk, what brought you here? Has it met your needs? Are there specific things, more information that you're looking for? Should we bring them back to talk about more? Well, I brought up a poll just in case uh, <laughs> that we usually do at the end of the session. So that's what you wanted me to, to bring mm -hmm. up. Bill. So here you are. Well, that's, that's part of it, but I, I'm looking for a little bit more interaction from people to just give me a good sense. I help people get blogs out there. So if there's more information that you're looking for, this would be a good time to say, I would like to read a blog about this particular topic. And feel free to use the chat to answer or just speak up and mute yourself and provide some comments, please. Um, this is Balvinder. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm um, I'm from um, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and I was like, what brought me here is like I'm working on a model, and uh, I'm not getting enough time to get really started with smart sim, but I was really interested in this idea. So I was working with Sam, um, and he got me started, uh, and uh, then I got busy with other things. But uh, my plan is to. Uh, get back to that and uh, work on the model which I was working on. So we we already used a tool, which uh, uh, which we are not very happy with at the moment. And uh, smart sim sounds like a good way to go. So that's what I wanted to learn more about it and uh, see if I can use it uh, in my application. Just curious what what other tool you you use just so to understand the broader market. We use the uh, FKB. Uh, um, oh yeah, yeah. Portland Kira Bridge. Yeah. So, definitely. like, it works great. It was really easy to get started off. Um, it was. It is a simple library. You just build it and use it. And, uh, but uh, I think Smart Sim offers much more. So we. I just wanted to explore like what it has to offer and 
how does it compare with the FKB bridge? Um, yeah, so that was my motivation. Yeah, no, and I, I mean, I, I think I can kind of answer that a little bit. I mean, I think with the Fortran Keras bridge, you know, uh, like you said, I think it's if you just want to kind of integrate an AI model um, that's already trained, that you know, you kind of have that's that's a little more static. You know, that is definitely something that you can use. I think from a capability perspective, the advantage is that SmartSim as a as a kind of more of a machine learning data science framework offers is not only can you add in models. Uh, but at the same time, you can do an online analysis, you, analysis, you can do visualizations, um, you can do like steering, like if you're running a bunch of ensembles, you can do se steering, uh, like computational steering. So it really allows for a lot more uh, flexibility because what we focused on, the kind of the core component that we focused on was more about the data exchange and how to, uh, you know, uh, how to kind of step outside of that MPI pair, uh, uh, the, that traditional uh, uh, paradigm of communication and how can we use, you know, just pass over a singular, singular, single tensor and then what are all the things you could do with it in memory uh, and at scale. And, you know, the other thing, I, I think the other advantage that, you know, the SmartSim framework offers over the Fortran Keras bridge is the, the FKB is really, is um, pretty, um, what's the word, a little bit fragile in the sense that it's, you know, the, 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 the two have to align. So if there's any updates uh, in yeah. terms of, if there's any updates to uh, Keras, you know, you've got to update the, the library, right? So it's, it's a, a little fragile in that, um, so we're not necessarily as robust as we'd like it to be, or, you know, like, like as we like to see in applications. Um, uh, so, so I think those are kind of some of the, the, the main differences uh, between the two things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We also found it um, like limiting in the sense that whenever we wanted to do something new, we had to wait for somebody to implement that in FKB or right. we had to do it ourselves. So that was a limitation. And I have one another question. So now that uh, uh, HPC can be run on like clouds are more accessible to HPC applications. So I was just wondering if anybody has tried smart sim hpc combination on clouds or whether it would be beneficial or is it more beneficial to run it on like regular traditional clusters yeah so it it definitely worked i mean correct me if i'm wrong out but uh, we've definitely run smart sim on cloud services before um, yeah. and and there really isn't any issue on there and then the user experiences primarily the same because uh, SmartSim just abstracts away a lot of that kind of workload manager launching work. Um, uh, I haven't specifically done it, but I know Sam has run it on AWS, for, for example. Okay. okay. Yeah, and if you have more questions about that, you know, feel free to join the Slack and, and ask us that. I mean, some of it comes down to, you know, you know, resourcing costs, availability, you know, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of, a lot of factors there, but our goal overall is to allow people to move, uh, you know, hopefully long-term be able to move between, uh, you know, whatever computational scan scaling makes sense for your solution uh, in order to, you know, kind of provide these features uh, and these capabilities uh, leveraging um, SmartSim, right? Because we understand that uh, moving forward, you know, kind of the, the, the integration of simulations and AI is really going to mix, right? And those environments include cloud environments, right? It's not just a, it's not necessarily singularly an HPC problem. And so we want to make sure that we provide the flexibility uh, to be able to run under 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 all the contexts, you know, that makes sense for you know your kind of your computational needs. So okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, and that's uh, uh, Jim uh, wrote. Cloud systems don't tend to scale as well as HPC and models like Mom. Right, <laughs> that's very true. Uh, uh, and like I said, I think it depends on. Uh, definitely depends on the type of simulation you're running and the type of scale you're trying to run at. Uh, but one advantage, I guess, one reason we'd like to be able to make sure that people could still use it in a cloud scenario is imagine if you're doing some sort of testing or model development, and what you have accessible to you, or maybe the budget that you have at the moment is limited in the sense that you know you can't necessarily or you don't necessarily have access to an HPC system 
uh, we want to be able to make sure that it, you know you can do the processing both and, and development both locally and on the cloud and then move to HPC scale uh, when appropriate, right? And that you have the same user experience, the same APIs uh, and the same capabilities uh, and, and just be able to execute at the scale at the scale you need. Um, hello, this is Tina. Hey, Tina. Hey, um, so I know Dale asked why were we why we were here. And so I just wanted to share why I am here. Um, just Slack has been really good with allowing a lot of us to connect who would have never otherwise ever been able to connect. Yeah. I've always wanted to, you know, learn and be a part of the, the HPE developer community. So when I got a chance to see the Munch and Learns and just be here, I'm thoroughly excited. So I hope I'm not embarrassing myself, but I'm here because I want to be a part of the community and to learn from all of you, to connect with you and to, you know, hopefully one day be a completely engulfed in the community. And I'm just really excited. And if anybody here has anything to offer to help me along the path and you know, I'm studying Python. I'm new to Python. So I'm in a current process of studying Python and, you know, just really, really elated <laughs> that I was able to connect with the HB develop, uh, developer community. So that's why I came. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, and it's super, uh, uh, it's super awesome to have you here. And, you know, Fred's saying start with some of our workshops and that's, you know, a fantastic idea, right? It's always uh, in our group, especially around AI, you know, for our group or especially around AI, learning is is constant, right? So we're constantly in uh, beginner mode and trying to figure out new tools and new frameworks and what people are using. And so getting your, you know, getting um, what's great about this community is with the workshops, uh, having some uh, hands-on tutorials uh, is a way to, you know, really continue to, to further your career and stay connected to all kind of the great, uh, you know, um, the wider tools that are out there, uh, you know, the stuff that HPE has to offer and kind of, you know, how those uh, tendrils reach out into the to the wider development community. So that's awesome. And they posted, Fred posted it, uh, 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 an example for you for, for Python, if you want to check that out. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm very yeah. excited. Thank you so much. Yeah, super glad you're here. Welcome. <laughs> And yeah, as Dale said, you can also work with us on some blogs and things, and, and hopefully you'll get a chance to get our wonderful background. <laughs> okay, yes. so with that being said, I, if there's any more questions, please, I mean, we still have like seven minutes left, so we can still post a few questions if needed. Uh, if not, then uh, I, can, uh, I can close the call, but uh, please take time to to fire up some one last minute question if needed. If not, then I will leave it with the final slide that I'm just showing right now, showing you all the different uh, assets that the HP Dev community is providing you with, being the website, the Slack channels, the newsletter, uh, contacting us through mails or Twitter or in the Yammer group or Slack, or the workshops on demand and uh, the other stuff like dimension learning and so on and so forth. So there's only one slide that you need to know about. This is the one and please incorporate it in any type of uh, customer interaction, I would say, at the end of your slide set. It's always interesting to show that uh, there is a de developer community program within HPE and that people should know about it. With that being said, uh, I wish you a very good end of the day and uh, hopefully to see you soon on the 28th, if I remember well, uh, for the next uh, work, uh, Dev Talk, sorry. And otherwise, enjoy the end of your day and thanks a lot for attending this workshop. And I would like to thank you as well, uh, Ben, oh. Alessandro, and Matt yeah. oh. for this great presentation. Yeah, and, and the uh, introduction uh, of Smart Team. <laughs> yeah, and if you get any news from uh, from Sam, we'll be very happy to, to know how is he. Hopefully nothing wrong with him. And uh, so have a good day and you can stop the recording and uh, we can close the call right now. <laughs>